like to welcome you to the UW CSE Colloquium. Uh, we are very happy to have Michael Bernstein here with us today to talk about crowd-powered systems. Uh, Michael is a PhD student at MIT. He does undergraduate at Stanford. Um, he's won NSF Graduate Fellowship, the Microsoft Research Fellowship, um, and a variety of uh, award-winning papers, including a uh, best paper at WIS 2010, the major technical HCI conference, uh, best paper at ICWSM uh, 2011, which is a major social media conference. Um, and he's going to be getting at least a best paper nomination at CHI 2012 this year. Uh, it may still turn out as a best paper, we don't know yet. Um, and so uh, please welcome Michael, and I uh, look forward to hearing this. Thanks. 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 So today I'm going to talk to you about crowd-powered systems, which are interactive systems that embed human intelligence in the form of large crowds of people interacting online. And to set the stage for why we might want this, I'll start with the word processor. And that's because the word processor might be the most heavily designed, heavily used interactive system ever. And like most interactive systems, it's supporting a complex cognitive process, writing, and it's doing so by offloading tasks that the user might not otherwise want to do. You might think of how we have uh, dynamic programming algorithms now to do aesthetic layout of documents. We have language models to do spelling. We can support grammar checking. But at some level, what we really have no support for is the core act of writing, or, or what, you, what you might say is editing. What I mean are questions of expressivity, word choice, phrasing, or even, say, cutting your document. Uh, how many times have you been in a situation like this one, where you have a strict word or page limit, uh, a couple hours until a deadline, and you're a little bit over length? I think we've all sort of spent more time in this situation than we'd like to admit. Now, Historically, if you had this, this kind of problem, you could turn to editors, a human editor. If you were a published author, they would help you cut your text, they would help you find the, the uh, grammar and spelling errors that you might otherwise not have seen, and more. And in a sense, the, writer, the editor then became a core part of the writer's toolbox. But it was never a part of the toolbox that we could wire back into the software. Because if you wanted to do that, you would have needed to have that editor available really at any time on call, and that just hasn't been possible. But today we do have crowds of people online taking on really complex tasks. Just within computer science, we're using crowds to train machine learning algorithms like uh, labeling images or transcribing audio. We're, we're doing user studies. We're executing large-scale social science experiments. And broader, we're actually seeing scientific breakthroughs like here with Foldit, or even writing an encyclopedia. These are all things that crowds are accomplishing. And this isn't a new phenomenon. In fact, it stretches back to the 1700s when the British royal astronomers started distributing spreadsheets to do mathematical calculations for nautical tables through the mail. And it reached its height in the 1930s with a WPA project that employed 450 so-called human computers, which is the source of the term computer that we use today. But what I'd like to point out is that this lineage of distributed human computation has really acted as a batch platform. That is to say, you take a lot of work, you push it over the wall, you wait minutes, hours, days, and you bring it back and do your analysis. What I'm going to talk about is how we can turn crowdsourcing into an interactive platform. That is, rather than having a single editor support your document, imagine if we could have tens or hundreds of people all read your text, make suggestions for ways that we could, uh, that we could shorten it, for example. We could algorithmically identify the best suggestions and give you access to them via user interface. That's what I mean when I say a crowd-powered system. It's an interactive system that is combining machine intelligence with crowd intelligence. Now, if we wanted to do this, we'll run into a few challenges. One of them is quality. Uh, I asked 1,000 people on the internet just a couple weeks ago to flip a coin and to either type H for heads or T for tails. And in this room, my trust will get about 50-50. Uh, on the internet, it turns out that there's about a two to one ratio <laughs> of heads to tails. And this isn't a problem that the internet's a biased coin. It's that people are satisficing. They exhibit particular biases when they satisfy. And you see activity like this. In fact, this doesn't actually add up to 100, because fully 7% of people who did this did not type H or T. They typed full the entire word. They, in, they included spell, uh, spelling errors or the enigmatic F. <laughs> These are the kinds of situations that come up when you're dealing with crowds as a core part of your software. And we need to understand 
how to not only deal with them, but actually take advantage of them. A second challenge is speed or latency. If we're building interactive applications, which is our goal here, you need fast response. But if you look at how quickly crowds have acted in the past, you're looking at papers that say things like, extremely fast 48 hours. It's pretty slow. Cheap and fast 190 hours. This is not the kind of thing that we can embed within interactive computation. In fact, some folks at Berkeley ran survival analysis and found that your wait time, the half-life, uh, ranges somewhere between two days and 12 hours, depending on how much you're paying. What I'm going to talk about today are crowd-powered systems. I'm going to demonstrate interactive systems that are embedding crowd intelligence as a core part of how they work. And in order to do that, I'm going to introduce some computational techniques that will produce high-quality results and fast results. I'm going to focus for most of this talk on paid crowdsourcing, which you might be familiar with uh, as via, for example, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Near the end, I'll come back and show you how we can do things with non-paid crowdsourcing markets that can do things that Mechanical Turk would never be able to accomplish. But if you're not familiar with Mechanical Turk, it's an online marketplace where people will put up small tasks like labeling an image or transcribing audio, and will ask uh, somewhere between, say, one and five cents to do it. There are millions of these tasks that are done every year. And if you look at it, the populations are roughly about 40% in the US, 40% in India, 20% elsewhere in the world. And these distributions around gender, education, and income tend to actually mirror the population distribution. So you really have some educated, high-earning people who are on these markets just to either supplement their income, or in some cases, others who are entire, getting their entire income stream from these systems. So I'm going to focus in this talk on two main systems. The first one is called Soylent. It's a word processor with a crowd inside. And the goal here is to really convince you that the entire uh, agenda is worth pursuing. In the second half, I'll be introducing a system called Adrenaline, which takes these concepts and tries to make them happen in real time for interactive systems. So I'll start with Soylent. Soylent is people. It's a word processor that recruits crowds in order to aid complex writing tasks. What I'd like you to hopefully take away from this section as I talk is that we're now embedding crowds as first order elements of a software system. And that in order to do that, we're going to introduce a design pattern that's going to decompose open-ended tasks into something that crowds can tackle much more successfully. Rather than tell you about it, I'm actually going to show it to you. Oh, no. <laughs> this is what happens when I'm not on the MIT network. OK, so this is the Soylent paper actually uh, running within Soylent. Let's say that this is, in fact, as, as you see, a bit too long. And I think that this conclusion here is, in fact, uh, the, the problem. So what I'm going to do is I've just selected the text, and I'm going to push it off to shorten. Shorten is one of uh, Soylent's features. What it's going to do is put a series of tasks on Mechanical Turk. You don't need to worry too much about the details here yet. I'll come back to it. But what you can see is we're pushing a bunch of tasks that are having people mark, it, mark up the paragraph, make edit, vote. And when it all comes back, we can combine all of these suggestions to produce a revised paragraph that looks like this. Anything that's underlined in purple has been identified as being shortenable. And you can see here, for example, in, that one, in this one example, several different suggestions that the crowd made about how to shorten it. We can then consider the uh, space of all possible paragraphs here, sort them by length, and I can get, then give you a slider. And as you drag the slider, your text rewrites itself to become shorter or longer or anywhere in between. Hopefully at that point, you can come back and your paper's on 10 pages. So that shows you how you, may, you might be able to actually generate new kinds of interactions, but we can also support existing AI systems. Um, for example, Crowdproof is a crowd-assisted spelling and grammar checker. We're using crowds to identify errors that Microsoft Word did not, and we're going to give uh, specific changes that can be made and explain the problem in plain English. As you can see over here in right, on the right, the crowd has suggested that the sentence is long. Uh, and actually, the second one, they, they identified some parallel sentence structure issues. What's interesting about the second one is that uh, I think eight authors and six reviewers all missed this. And the reason is that it's on the fifth page of the document. And by the time we're at the bottom of the fifth page, our eyes are getting a little tired. But crowds can come in, have a separate perspective, and aren't tired because they're seeing it for the first time. 
so they can catch these errors. We can also talk about how we might be able to use crowds to help understand the user's intention. When I write, I tend to actually leave uh, brackets like this where I'll come back and figure out the citation information later. I'll need to fill it into BibTeX, but I, it's too much work now. Let's say that I actually wanted to get crowds to help with that. The human macro allows me to sort of request arbitrary work within the word processor. Uh, for example, I might take those citations, and I might want to find BibTeX to fill them out. And at this, in this case, what I'll do is I'll actually show you this is what one of our users wrote as the description. Uh, it doesn't have particularly good grammar. In fact, it's not very specific at all. Uh, gives you some notion that maybe Google Scholar is a good place to look. So I'm just going to copy paste it in here. We can choose how many people we want to do it, how much we want to pay them. And when it's done, we'll come back with something like this. That, in short, is Soylent. The goal is to take crowds and use them to augment and push forward our sense of what's possible with interactive systems. So let's say you wanted to try and go build something like Soylent. We did. The naive way you might try to implement this will not work. And that's because when you're talking about open-ended tasks, and what I mean by open-ended is something where there's, say, not a multiple choice answer or a ground truth that's easy to check, crowds actually tend to pr produce pretty poor work. In fact, we have a, a rule of thumb. We call it the 30% uh, rule, which suggests that about 30% of what you get back is going to be unsatisfactory in some way. You're not going to want to return that to the user. And this is just too poor to actually embed within a software system as it is. So why does that happen? I'll give you an example here. This is a, a paragraph I got off of a high school essay website. It's actually a pretty bad paragraph. You can see just a few of the errors right here. I don't recommend you turn this in. But we put it up on Mechanical Turk, and we asked a bunch of workers to just proofread and correct it, what CrowdProof should be doing. And you get some pretty poor results. Here's an example of the kind of thing that you get. One type of worker, the lazy worker, is going to do as little work as they need to in order to signal that they've done the work and get paid. Given this bad paragraph, the lazy worker is going to do this. Make one edit to the most obvious problem in the paragraph. And I say obvious because it was probably underlined in their browser as the only word that was misspelled. So you leave the rest of these errors completely untouched. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the eager beaver. This is someone who also wants to send a signal that they're doing the work, but they go outside the task parameters. You give them the same paragraph, they make several good edits, but they also decide to add new lines between every sentence in the paragraph. This isn't particularly useful either, although they may have legitimately thought it would have been a good idea. So taking a step back, these personas are not particular to Mechanical Turk. If you look at, say, Wikipedia, you see some workers who are just, some uh, editors who are just getting by, others who are trying too hard and introducing errors at the same time. And in my opinion, the state of programming with crowds is really early days right now. We lack programming design patterns that will help us get high quality results out of the crowd. These are design patterns like, in, at least in UI technology, things like model view controller that codified best practices. What I'm going to introduce here is a design pattern called Find, Fix, Verify that's intended to support programming with crowds over these large open-ended tasks. And effectively what we're doing is we're decomposing this open-ended task into three stages where we're finding the problem, fixing it, and verifying it. I'll show an example here in the space of <clears throat> shortening. So we use the same algorithm with, uh, with proofreading, in fact. Instead of having people make an edit, First, we ask them to effectively vote on areas of the paragraph that can be shortened. We're having them find errors. We're then going to look for independent agreement to certify that a particular area of the paragraph needs work. It becomes a patch, and we can form all of these out in parallel through the rest of the, of the algorithm, in particular to a fixed stage. In the fixed stage, we ask the, the workers to, given a particular error, fix it. So given a highlighted section, propose a shorter version. We gather a bunch of these suggestions, we randomize their order, and we pass them on to a verify stage. Verification is effectively trying to enforce some invariance here. We want to make sure, A, that it's not changing the original meaning of the text, and B, that it's not introducing new errors. Anything that survives this particular vote, we can then pass back to the application software 
and use in something like Shorten or Crowdproof. OK, so why is this a good idea? In particular, why would you ever want to split find and fix? Why not just let writers make the changes? In particular, what we've done here is we're giving the lazy workers a very specific task. We can ask them to find two to three areas of the paragraph, and they can't get away without doing that. And in the fix stage, we can point them at a particular problem and say, fix this, so they cannot get away with fixing some other easier problem. At the same time, we can take advantage of the eager workers who are going to help us find all of, the, all of the challenges with the text, and we'll be definitely sure to fix the, uh, the problem. It also allows us to group suggestions. We don't have multiple uh, changes that are potentially all focusing on different or the same core problem. We know which edit is corresponding to which problem. The idea behind the verify stage is that our quality actually goes up by placing workers in productive tension. You have one group that's proposing solutions, and another group that's evaluating whether those solutions are actually good ones. Now, there's actually a large group of literature, some of which has come out of here, um, that's starting to look at this nice intersection between how crowds work and, algor and algorithms can work. And this is really playing into this larger literature that we'll come back to later. OK, so does this work? We wanted to know, in particular, three things. How high is the quality of the work that you get out of Soylent? How long do you have to wait for it? And how much are you going to have to pay? So what we can do is we can feed a bunch of texts, in particular, say, to shorten everything from TechCrunch, uh, HCI papers, down to emails from the Enron corpus, and see the edits that it makes. These are some of the edits that it makes. Um, in particular, what we see overall is that we cut text down to about 15%, I'm sorry, we cut about 15% of the original text length. What that means is that you could take your original document, that's 11 pages, hold constant all of the figures, the boilerplate, the title, feed it through shorten, and get a 10-page paper back without changing any of your core ideas. So how does this work? Generally, workers are focusing on linguistic cuts. They're avoiding any sort of technical content. You might see here, for example, the phrase are going to have to can be shortened to just have to. Sometimes they're combining sentences. Again, here we can get rid of an entire phrase. The resulting sentence reads, the larger tangible bits project, comma, which introduced the Metadesk and two companion platforms. Now, this doesn't always work. Here are a couple things that go wrong. The first is that workers aren't part of your community of practice. That is, they aren't experts like you. So there's a, a particular academic signaling phrase. In this paper, we argue that. Workers just find it boring and want to cut it. <laughs> a more endemic problem that I think is particularly interesting has to do with the parallelism, where workers in different patches can't see what the workers in another patch are doing. So you end up with a sentence like this, where in one case they cut the main phrase, and in another case they cut the parenthetical, rendering the resulting sentence completely meaningless. So if you wanted to fix this, you would either need to start merging patches that were near each other, or you could talk about having another worker do a sanity check at the end. But this is going to be key to any kind of parallelized algorithm in this sense. OK. So how, how much does this cost? Well, we had hundreds of people look at each of these documents across Find, Fix, and Verify, paid about $1.25 per paragraph. We can get it back down to about 30 cents a paragraph if you're willing to wait much longer. Uh, and we can go from there. You can talk about ways to optimize this, for example. So how long does this take? Well, there are two types of wait time. The first is the length of time you have to wait between when Soylent asks for help and when a worker accepts that task. If we sum the median find, the median fix, and the median verify, we get about 20 minutes. So in the second half of the talk, I'm going to show how we can take that 20 minutes, which is kind of slow, and get it down to two seconds. So we'll come back to that. The work time has to do with the time between when a worker says they're going to work on something and when they actually complete it. And that's much faster. It's about two minutes. So in the limit, you could actually expect to get results back from Soylent around two minutes. So we can turn to something like Crowdproof, here giving it text from, say, bad Wikipedia pages. Or I'll focus here on the top one, which is an ESL essay, something written by someone who's not a native English speaker. You can see some of the edits it makes. If you throw sort of the off-the-shelf uh, grammar checker at it, it finds about 30% of the errors. 
Soylent, crowdproof, finds about two-thirds of the errors. And interestingly, they find different errors. So if you combine them, you find about 80% of the errors. Once it finds an error, it will fix it about 90% of the time. In fact, what tends to happen is that the only ones that are missed are when two errors are very close to each other and the lazy workers come in and fix the obvious one and leave the other one. All right, so again, the human macro, we can feed it a bunch of different tasks, like finding BibTeX, as I showed you, finding figures, changing the tense of my short story. And again, I'll focus here on the first one. We can feed it input that looks like this. If you're familiar with the literature, you actually know this is an incorrect citation, uh, but the workers managed to figure it out and return the right result. Overall, the 30% rule comes into play here because there's no verification step. So you get about 70% that are completely correct and about 88% that are generally trying to do the right thing but might have some small error. So verification could improve this. Okay, so far in the talk I've introduced Soylent, which is introducing a new class of interactive crowd-powered systems. I showed you the find, fix, verify design pattern, and I motivated it via these notions of the lazy worker and the eager beaver. I'm going to turn to the second main system in my talk, which is called adrenaline. And adrenaline is really motivated by this notion that the kinds of systems we can build are hugely constrained by how long, how long it takes the crowd to help us out. So in particular, uh, I'll give an example through here. This is a go button. When we click the go button, a timer is going to appear and count up to 60 seconds. So here we go, 60 seconds. We say 60 seconds because that's the best that some pretty innovative work out of the University of Rochester was able to produce results from the crowd. Unfortunately, now after 10 seconds, we know that the user has already lost their connection to the task. So we've already lost. Our goal in this part is to create on-demand, real-time crowds. What I'm going to introduce are ways that you can actually produce crowds in two seconds. So you make a request, and just a few seconds later, you're going to get a group of five or more people. You're going to use that to do traditional crowdsourcing tasks like votes in five seconds. So again, you're going to make the request, and within just a few seconds, you're going to find out which of the two ties you should wear today. And we're going to use it to execute large searches in 10 seconds. For example, choosing the best frame in a longer video. And now, in less than the length of time it would normally take to get any results back from the crowd, I've introduced this entire section of the talk to you. All right, we built this into an application called Adrenaline. Adrenaline is a crowd-powered camera, that is, built into your cell phone camera, it attempts to find the best moment to take the photo. You can imagine that we want, ever since the introduction of the digital camera, to get immediate results and feedback when you take your picture. We don't want to go back to an era where you have to go develop your film over hours or overnight. We want to give immediate feedback such that you can share it with your friends, take another picture, that kind of thing. So this is the kind of thing that Adrenaline does. Here's a video that someone took of a, of a high five. And uh, as of this fade right now, we've just made the request to workers. And you're going to see people jump in just a couple seconds later. They're trying to find the best frame. They're down along the bottom there. They focus it in. And just a couple seconds later, we have a final frame. Here are a few other kinds of photos we generate. People trying different angles. People trying different poses. Action shots, like jumping off of a bench and people just dancing around, not really sure what's going to end up, um, and then the crowd finding that, that moment. Okay, so let's say we want to build adrenaline. What do we need to do? We need to solve two problems. The first is getting the crowds there quickly. How do we recruit quickly? And in order to do that, I'm going to introduce a technique that we call the retainer model. The idea behind the retainer model is that we're changing how recruitment works. We're actually going to sign up workers in advance and have them Go work on other tasks. They don't need to do anything for us. We're going to pay them money to come back later when we need them. When we have a task, they can come back because we'll alert them via JavaScript alert. So they're making a little bit of extra money only to promise to come back when we need them. Does this work? It's an empirical question. We put out thousands of tasks over many different hours of the day, many different days of the week on Mechanical Turk, and I'll draw a graph here. 
On the x-axis, you're going to see the length of time it took workers to come back after we put up the JavaScript alert. And on the y-axis, you're going to see a CDF. What percentage of the workers have come back within that length of time? So if they haven't been waiting very long, you see a curve that looks like this. And if they're waiting a little bit longer, you see a curve that looks like this. What you can get out of this is that if they're waiting less than 10 minutes, you get about half of the workers back within two seconds. And in fact, you get about three quarters of the workers back within three seconds. So you're really able to produce a flash crowd incredibly quickly here. What happens if they're waiting even longer? Well, now then fewer of them return. We found out in a separate experiment, though, that if you offer a small bonus for returning quickly, you can take a line that looks something like this, about 25% chance of coming back, and push it all the way back up as if they hadn't been waiting at all. OK, how much does this cost? Well, I said about a half cent a minute, right? So it's about 30 cents an hour to keep someone on retainer. This already allows us to build some interesting interactive applications. We built a simple application called AB, Instant Votes. If I want to know uh, which of these two logos looks better, for example, for design feedback, we, we hit the Go button. And just a few seconds later, this is a replay of a recorded trial from our evaluation. You get results like that. So we've closed that loop. Now, OK, so the retainer model gets us the crowd in two seconds, and we can do votes in five seconds. And that's great if our goal is to pick between two pictures for adrenaline. But it's not. It's to pick between 100 pictures. It's a very large search space. And if you try sort of, again, your basic approaches of either carving it up or just having everyone go at it, it's too slow. Because the work time dominates. They get there quickly, but it takes the workers a long time to decide on a, on a final frame. So what we really need to do is to help workers work together to overcome this slow work time. And the way we're going to do that is through the notion of synchronous crowds. That is, the retainer model for the first time allows us to guarantee more or less that these crowds are all going to appear at once, not sort of come in and out as you would normally see on Mechanical Turk. And once you do that, you can get them to work collaboratively. In fact, I'm going to show you how we can get synchronous crowds to act faster collectively than even the single fastest member of that crowd. The way we're going to do that is through an approach we call rapid refinement. The idea behind rapid refinement is to look for potential agreement as it's likely to arise later. As soon as we see something that is likely to create agreement, we will then reduce the search space to focus people's attention on that and do it over and over until we get down to a single frame. Here's what it looks like. On the left here, we have the, the server's view of the situation. And on the right, three workers. The workers get ran randomly uh, started across different points in the video. And we see them appear on the server. So we're going to loop until we get down to a single frame. And we're going to look for agreement. How many workers are within some particular range of each other? We're going to wait. Right now, there are none. We're going to wait until there are, say, 2 thirds of them agreeing. As they continue to explore, say they're not agreeing. And then eventually, you have two workers who come into the same region. You don't want a false positive, so we actually institute a, a short timeout. They need to stay in that same range for two seconds. And once they've done that, we start a new phase. We restrict the search area. Anyone who is in that area can continue to stay where they are. Anyone who is outside is not getting paid yet. We'll need to make sure to agree with at least one phase and gets reinitialized to a random point of the remaining search space. And we can run that again and again until we get down to a single frame. So I'll show you what, again what this looks like in real time. This is the same video I showed you before, just the bottom part clipped. They're searching. They find the same area. We clip it down, two agree, three agree, and we're down to a single frame. OK, so again, does this work? Do the retainer model and rapid refinement together give us real-time results? What's the quality like? And what happens when it fails? So we got 24 people from our university to take a bunch of video photos using adrenaline. And we produced five different output photos from each input video. Three of them, so one was rapid refinement, as I've described it to you. And the other two were effectively baselines. One was our gold standard, a professional photographer was allowed to choose the best photo. And the third was effectively an off-the-shelf production system in computer vision for choosing good photos 
uh, to represent or aesthetic videos from, uh, I'm sorry, photos from videos. The other two were crowdsourcing approaches. Generate and vote is a little bit more like find, fix, verify, where we nominate lots of different frames and then go through to a separate phase where we have everyone vote on the best one. And generate one is the single fastest member of the crowd. We take the first thing we get back, no questions asked. We can then have the people who take the photos rate on a nine point Likert scale how much they like them. What we see is that rapid refinement lives, is statistically better than computer vision and statistically indistinguishable from a, from a professional photographer. In fact, here you can see that the two of them are only one frame off from each other. More commonly, what you'll see is that the crowd agreed on the general area with the professional photographer, but not the exact frame, and computer vision sort of uh, chooses a different moment. And sometimes you see something like this. I'm pointing in the lower left here, where uh, his eyes are closed and, the, and, the, and, the, and it's blurry. So what happened? You had two workers who were interested in different areas of the, of the video that were near each other, with nothing interesting in between. But the workers appeared near each other, the algorithm snapped down to the, to the area between, and they were stuck in a local maxima that was pretty bad. So that's one challenge that this is going to have. Let's look at timing. Rapid refinement was not only the fastest, but was the most reliably fast, which, with, which with interactive systems I would argue is at least as important. You want to be able to guarantee that this is going to return quickly. In fact, what tends to happen is that sometimes you do have fast members of the crowd, and sometimes you don't. In Generate 1, you can see the sort of long tail here as you look right. Rapid refinement pulls up that tail and adds probability mass to the left, giving you more of a guarantee. Generate and vote still executed in 45 seconds, which is much faster than the 20 minutes Soylent took, and in fact matched or beat the quality of the professional photographer. So that's pretty cool. We made some trade-offs here. One strength of rapid refinement is that we're now giving quick results to the user. Within 10 seconds, we can return that first refinement via the user interface to the user. And we don't need a separate verification stage, because verification is built into the agreement as they're searching. One weakness is that we're now sacrificing some notion of quality for speed. You could think of this similar to a randomized algorithm, right? Where you're getting some notion of exactness off in the distance, but with high probability you're going to be pretty good, and it's much faster. A more endemic problem, and one that I think is key to both this and Find, Fix, Verify, and many other systems in this space, is that we're stifling individual creativity. If there were a particularly good photographer in our crowd, they get no special ability to point out the good photo. We need to talk about ways that we can identify and empower those individuals in these kinds of algorithms. In terms of generalizability, we're really talking about continuous search spaces here. Uh, just within, this, within uh, photography, you can think of tuning brightness, contrast, color curves, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so together, the retainer model and rapid refinement are able to combine to execute these large searches in about 10 seconds. And this allows us to close the loop. This is Photoshop. I want to demonstrate how we can now support lots of different tasks, say, creative tasks. Let's say you were a Photoshop artistic designer, and you wanted to actually create a poster for a rock concert. And you wanted that rock concert to have lots of people uh, in the crowd screaming, being excited. You can use uh, Photoshop's Puppet Warp. You can author the points that you want changed. And we can push that off to the crowd who have been on retainer and tell them to make this person look excited. You can see here, as, as they're moving the, the points around, we can then take all of their suggestions, draw them back into Photoshop, and produce something like this. So here we've closed the loop. We've gone back to a productivity or creative application. And in fact, with eight workers on retainer, you got feedback within two seconds. We got the first figure within a half minute, and we kept generating figures out to several hundred. You got a new one every three seconds after that. OK, so let's step back. What we've done with the retainer model in particular is that we've systematized recruitment for crowdsourcing systems. By systematizing it, we can then actually turn around and talk about how would you optimize this for large scale deployment? How would these things work at large scale? We can cast the retainer model 
using as a, as a queuing theory problem. You have some notion of tasks appearing, you have some notion of how long it takes to recruit workers, and then you can ask questions about what's the probability that I have a task that needs to be tackled and I have C workers on retainer, but no one's there to help. I've run out of workers on retainer. This, is, this can be derived from Erlang's loss formula. You get a pi of C that looks like this. It's the probability that we can't help when a, when a task comes in. You can ask the expected number of workers on retainer, which tells you your cost. You can then plot those against each other, and then you can treat this as a minimization problem. How many workers do I need on retainer to guarantee that, say, one in 10,000 tasks are the ones that are dropped? So given your traffic intensity, the number of tasks that are coming in, you can find the point on, on your curve that's the highest or farthest to the left and still below the line. This has lots of other benefits. We can talk about what happens when you share the retainer pool across re requesters. You can talk about how you can route tasks to workers to avoid starvation. And you can do something that we call predictive recruitment, which is fun. If we know that tasks are coming in at a fast rate and that a worker uh, it takes longer to come back, we can, we can call them back before we have the task ready with the notion that by the time the task comes, they'll be there. And if we do that, we actually can get feedback within just a half second, which is really starting to blur these cognitive boundaries of you pressing the button and seeing the feedback immediately. Okay. So at this point, I've also introduced adrenaline, which is really pushing on trying to enable interactive crowd-powered systems. And we do that by introducing a couple of techniques for fast and synchronous crowds, the retainer model and rapid refinements. So across these two applications so far in the talk, I hope I've introduced you to this notion that we can build these interactive systems that embed crowd intelligence, and that in order to do so, we can construct computational techniques that tackle these original challenges of quality and of latency. Now more broadly, I work in the social computing space. I'm a social computing researcher who, with, who focuses on HCI. And paid crowds are just one part of this equation. There's a much broader space that I like to play in. I'd like to give you a brief tour through the, sort of the bigger picture of where we might end up. And that involves designing social computing applications that involves mining past crowd activity. These both have opportunities that Mechanical Turk could never really take on. <clears throat> I'll start with designing social computing systems. This is work that, uh, that appears at social computing conferences like ICWSM, uh, CSCW. You have HCI conferences like CHI and WIST. And the goal here is to create new kinds of social interactions online, potentially with the goal of creating crowds that can tackle problems that generic crowds would never be able to take on. I'll give one example, that of friend sourcing. Let's suggest that we wanted to actually personalize applications to you. Mechanical Turk would have no ability to predict what it is that you would be interested in, but your friends do know about you. We can layer incentives over the social network to get them to share that information for you, you to, sh uh, them, you to share it for them. We've deployed these, got Thousands, tens of thousands of tags on thousands of people, et cetera. And take this, for example, we can also deploy a news recommender that looks, that watches what people are forwarding to each other, uses that to build user models, make suggestions, improve the models. And we can build these personalized applications. For example, question routing. Does IUI research, intelligent user interfaces research, appear at the WIST conference? Here are some individuals who get, tend to get tagged with both of them, for example. What's cool is that none of these individuals needed to sit there and tag themselves what they're interested in. Because in friend sourcing, their friends tagged them for them. We also turn around and try to understand how social computing systems work and how we can design them. In fact, the status quo in research and practice says that if you want to have a great community, you need to have A, strong identity patterns like full names or pseudonyms at least, and permanent archives. You know, Google, for example. Then you turn around, and we noticed there were, there were communities like 4chan, or Slash B, if you're familiar with it, which has 7 million users, produces a huge volume of the culture that gets passed around the internet, but has no usernames and keeps no archives. So we can ask, what's going on there? We mined 5.5 million posts on this site. We found that the, it's extremely ephemeral. 
Median post spends five seconds in the attentional sphere of most users before being whisked off by new content and disappears completely from the site within five minutes, pushed off again by new content. Over 90% of the posts are completely anonymous. What we can take away from this is that these dynamics are actually potentially really in support of exactly the things that 4chan is creating, internet culture. OK, I'll turn also to crowd activity, effectively interactive data mining. And the idea here is that we don't need to create crowds if we can actually reach out to what they've already accomplished and draw them into interactive systems. Again, these are being articulated inside of HCI conferences like CHI and WIST. And the idea is to build interactive systems that are powered by social data or give you the ability to explore and understand the social data that you're collecting. I'll focus on just one called tail answers. Um, an answer is something like what you would get when you search for weather in Boston, which is probably going to be a little colder than here. Uh, not only do you get organic search results, but you get this answer, something that's been crafted directly for that query. And these are great, but they're only for head queries. That is, if you have information needs like this, which statistics says dominate our search experience, who won the Turing Award last year, what's the average body temperature of a dog, and so on, search engines can't help you. But we can turn to crowd data, and we can produce tail answers. So in addition, to, again, to these organic search results, we can create direct results that look something like this. The way we do this, I'm sorry, here are a few examples. Everything from the number of calories in a green apple, who invented the light bulb, uh, some substitutes of molasses, what's, where is a particular area code, a wide variety of information needs that are empirically somewhat important and in collectively hugely important. So again, how do we do this? We can look at how people are browsing. We can identify pages where they're particularly likely to issue a search query, navigate, and then abandon their search session, indicating that they might have found what they're looking for. We combine this by looking for a small percentage of searchers who use question words in their query, like, what is the temperature of a dog? And this gives us pages that have informational intent and where, where the result is likely to sit. We can then use something that looks a lot like Find, Fix, Verify to actually extract that content from the page and produce a search result from it. At the high level, my goal is to make social and crowd intelligence a really core part of interaction, of our software, and of computation more generally. In order to do that, I think we can scale up the complexity of the challenges that we're tackling with crowd computing. Think about harder and more important problems. Picture Find, Fix, Verify as a tight inner loop in a much larger system. In specific, we can talk about how we can use crowds to train machine learning systems and use those machine learning systems to push crowds on to harder and more interesting tasks. For example, in tail answers, what we started doing is using an, open, an information extraction system to suggest the answers and use the crowd to actually just filter out the false positives, which ends up being much more uh, uh, cheap and fast and gives lots of training data back to the information extraction system. We need to talk about better crowdsourcing platforms. Mechanical Turk is not where we need to end up. Think about having entire workforces, people with expertise who can program, who can sing, who can edit video, all in a particular market, being able to draw them together into a flash organization for a couple hours to complete a task and then disperse. What do you need to do to get there? How do you train, train them as they're working so that you start as a, as a level one Python programmer and work your way up to becoming an expert so that you're not just making money, you're developing your career? How do we fix the broken reputation system in these kinds of systems? I'm working with economics, people who think about mechanism design, et cetera. We also need to move from a situation where we're generating new algorithms all the time to one in which perhaps you have a better suggestion for how to do this. How do we compare? It's not just traditional runtime analysis. We need to think about what are the other costs that are going into this. For example, what kind of workload are we putting on the users? What kind of error rate is that generating? How do we formalize this and think about how we move forward, how we compare? This work opens up a lot of really interesting questions in ethics, privacy, attribution. Think about what it means now that we have crowd workers effectively as API calls within our software. How do we support contracts 
excuse me, how do we make sure that people make a living wage in systems like this, in expectation? What happens when your software has goals and dreams, right? When aspects of your software might actually want to communicate in social channels and where that might actually be beneficial for them to do. And then, now that we have thousands of people editing papers, does that mean we have thousands of authors on our papers? Or on the flip side, when someone discovers an error, whose fault is it? All of these are really big and open questions that I'd love to have conversations with you on. In the meantime, people have adopted this work. Uh, Find, Fix, Verify in particular has been used to do image segmentation, as you can see in the upper right, uh, for tracking the number of calories you've consumed in a meal. Uh, they've used it to label maps. People are modeling it using formal languages. And this work has been integrated into coursework at Stanford, Berkeley, UT Austin, and many other universities you can see here. Now, while Soylent was one of the first crowd-powered systems, we're really seeing a huge growth in this space across many universities. I've listed just a few projects here uh, that are, again, appearing uh, across universities like Stanford and Berkeley and Carnegie Mellon that are tackling lots of really interesting challenges, some of them with social missions, some of them with technical missions in the space of crowd computing. It's a really exciting space. I would encourage you, those of you who are not already in this space, to think about joining me. So I hope I've convinced you that we can build these crowd-powered systems that enable experiences that you would never be able to get just using crowd members because the quality or latency might be too low, but that machines themselves could not yet do either. We have a symbiotic relationship. And I hope I've convinced you along the way that we can use computation and make it a critical component of this wisdom of the crowds. I'm part of a small crowd of collaborators. My advisors, Rob Miller and David Carger at MIT, uh, researchers across a variety of institutions, many graduate students, again, all of whom have participated on the papers in this, pro in, in this talk. And at this point, I would be happy to turn it over for questions. Thanks. Yeah. Can you characterize the kinds of tasks that soil and adrenaline are and are not good for? Sure. Well, I think what's the hardest, sorry, so the question, just to make sure I understand, is that you want, you want to understand what the classes of open problems still are, right? We, what is it bad at? I would, I would say that I think the hardest thing right now continues to be these open-ended problems. Um, you, can, you can think about the broader space. There are some folks at Berkeley who, talk, who are looking at doing automatic task decomposition. Could the crowd itself determine its execution plan? These are things that, that work at a basic level but not very well yet. Um, I think we are getting better and better at being able to determine um, in close-ended sense, like if you have ground truth that's easily testable, like a multiple choice crowdsourcing question. That, I actually believe, we're sort of hitting an asymptote. We're getting pretty good at it. But I think pushing forward by proposing these applications that won't work the first time you try it is exactly how we get towards uh, ca categorizing this space. Yeah. Yeah, so it seems to me that you're relying on the fact that there are a lot of people out there who are willing to participate in this, these low-wage kinds of activities. And have you thought that this, it, it could be sort of like a pyramid scheme, right? As there are more and more of these types of systems that you're going to run out of human computers mm -hmm. on this. And, and do you have any thoughts about how to deal with that? Sure. So scale is, a, is a, of course, an obvious question. I'm not worried. Uh, here's why. There are perhaps, Amazon doesn't say exactly, but on this market there's about 10,000, maybe tens of thousands of workers who are signed up, maybe order hundreds, possibly thousands online at any given time. I said millions of tasks are done every year. If you think about, if you work out how much that's actually being spent, it's a minuscule market right now. There's a huge potential for growth. Think about systems like mobile works that are taking this social mission, asking what about the next billion people who could actually be lifted out of poverty by giving them access to these kinds of, uh, of these work platforms. So I think that there's huge numbers of people that we can still engage in a very positive way, even at a basic level. Then you push forward into people who actually have expertise. You could think about the entire workforce, in a sense, being reconfigured into this kind of world where you have people you, who you are spending, basically you are, the, you are your own boss. You are the ultimate contractor, spending time pulling together jobs as you, as you seem interested or fit. And then, we can also start talking about how do you optimize these kinds of systems. 
you know, it's, it is also the case that with the amount of silicon we can put down, you know, it's hard to match Moore's law still. We talk about how to optimize these things. And that's an interesting question too. So I'm not worried about hitting the wall with the number of people available. Even in the worst case, you can still turn around and actually make it a quid pro quo thing, right? Where I'm, uh, we value how much I actually, uh, how good I am at editing, uh, say an HCI paper, and a first, you know, an undergraduate student, and we, you know, I edit some papers, they edit it for me, all of these are possible. It's the broader space of social computing that can really answer these questions. Uh, yes? So I guess I have a similar question, <coughs> just how you explain engaging someone for 30 cents an hour? The, they're not engaged for 30 cents an hour. Um, well, the retainer model. In that sense, they're making money for doing nothing at all. It's effectively free money. If you look at how much people are making by, doing, by, by using Soylent, it's about the same, it's the same order of magnitude as they would be, it's making minimum wage. Um, so if you look at how much we're offering for these tasks, how many people we're paying, how long it takes them for a task, it works out to not even an order of magnitude difference. Um, and what, what we don't know how to do very well yet is explain in expectation we want to guarantee that they make some minimum wage. This requires platform support. I think it's a hugely important question and something that we need to tackle. Um, but so far, what ends up happening is that it's sort of the, re the requester's ball game, um, which I don't think is necessarily the ultimate thing you want to do. Yeah, Morgan? Uh, stemming from those two questions, have you thought about the sustainability of this with regards to inflation? And, and uh, um, if this becomes more in demand, I would imagine more people would expect more money from their services. So the question, and I mean, I, I again talk with, with economists about this. The question is how elastic this market is. Like if, when you raise the prices a little bit, do you get a lot more workers or do you get very few more workers? Um, and that's an empirical question that we can start to answer on Mechanical Turk. But again, Mechanical Turk is just a special case here. And I think there's a much broader space of, of these kinds of questions. Uh, so you touched on this briefly at the end, uh, this notion of how this will change maybe our ideas of authorship or ownership. Yes. And I have to admit that that was definitely at the forefront of my mind earlier in the talk. And I was just curious if you've received any feedback from people that have participated in the studies, if how they reacted to it, or if you've uh, just given any additional thought to that. Sure. I mean, we've looked into it from several angles. One is the legal angle. Right now, Me Mechanical Turk is a work for hire model. You can ask whether that's a good idea. It means that any work that gets done, I own. Is that a good idea? I don't know. Um, I've talked quite a bit to, in particular, copy editors. These are the, pap the people who, in particular, something like Crowdproof might actually displace. Um, and they have lots of interesting concerns and ideas for how to use this. You can talk about how that might actually let them focus on the bigger picture questions about authorship. Um, so I think it does dr like sort of focus the lens a little bit more, but I don't think it really uh, sort of reinvents the wheel in that sense. I think there's a question over here. Yeah. So the population of people on Turk or many crowdsourcing systems isn't really a random sample of, say, the American population. There are obvious demographic biases. How do you propose either detecting them or dealing with them? Well, so there's actually not as strong a bias as you would expect. I was talking about earlier in the talk. It roughly matches the, the distributions on gender, income, and education across the United States and India. So the open question is whether that will continue to be the case. Um, so. But I think the core of your question is, how do you know? Uh, and the question, there are a couple ways you could approach that. One is what Mechanical Turk already does, allows you to put out sort of qualification tests where you can effectively test, say, reading level or writing level and use that to categorize people. So they have to do a task in order to join your task later. I tend not to use that because it really cuts down on your population. Um, the other thing you can do is you can look toward these huge requesters like Crowdflower that put out lots and lots of requests and use them as they're effectively, their most valuable asset is the fact that they have very good knowledge of who's a good worker. Um, and there's some papers like there was one at NIPS about the multidimensional wisdom of crowds where you can start to think about people having particular things that they're good at or bad at and matching them to the, those kinds of tasks. I think that that's ultimately going to be an even more, more interesting question than sort of the general basic demographics that background that they're coming from. And let's thank him one more time. Thanks. Thanks.